Here are five more lost subclasses in D&D. These are subclasses published by Wizards of the Coast, but then killed off before an official release. But like the British in 1920s Egypt, that doesn't mean we can't desecrate a few tombs and have some fun. If you're looking to play something new or run something your players will never expect as an NPC, check these out. Raven Queen Warlock. If you're a longtime D&D player or a fan of Critical Role, you've probably heard of the Raven Queen. This objective 10 out of 10 dream goth GF hangs out in the shadow fell with a bunch of edgy elven simps and gives out contracts to aspiring warlocks. The bonus spells you get are pretty decent, giving access to silence, sanctuary, and cone of cold, but the real draw is spiritual weapon. Bonus action, consistent damage every turn that scales through the game? Awesome. Spiritual weapon also doesn't require concentration, so you can throw on a hex afterwards and become a single target nuke in the name of your dommy mommy goddess. Yes, spiritual weapon is an attack roll spell, so it will benefit from the hex bonus damage. You also get a free pet raven with magical powers. While it's on your shoulder, it is functionally untargetable, cannot take damage, and gives you 30 feet of dark vision and a bonus to your perception equal to your charisma. Your raven also gets its own initiative, and follows your commands, no action required. If it is ever killed, you get advantage on all attack rolls against the person who murdered it for the next 24 hours. Yes, advantage on all attack rolls for 24 hours. The Eldritch machine gun is back with auto-targeting. You can combine this with the Elven accuracy feat to really send it to the moon because now enemies have a choice. Do nothing about the annoying Raven giving your allies advantage on attacks by taking the help action every turn, or kill it and give you advantage on all attacks anyway. At sixth level, you can morph into your Raven familiar's body, letting you take non-combat actions like disengage, dash, hide, etc. This can be a great way to scout out a dungeon or an enemy. It's basically wild shape, but for warlocks. At 10th level, you get advantage on death saves and saves against the frightened condition, and resistance to necrotic damage. It's okay. Finally, at 14th level, you can cast the spell Finger of Death once per long rest. This is a solid single target 7th level spell that does decent damage and turns the target into a zombie under your control if you kill them with it. The Raven Queen Warlock is an excellent subclass. Flavorful, cool, unique, and decently strong. And one more time, a 10 out of 10 dream goth girl dominatrix waifu. I'm not made of stone. And speaking of, Stone Sorcerer. It's the sorcerer's answer to the Hexblade and the Bladesinger. This is a defensively focused melee spellcaster. Starting at level one, you grab proficiency with shields and martial weapons. The plus two to AC from a shield is pretty good. The weapon proficiencies would be nicer if they let you use your charisma to attack, but that's what Shadowblade is for, right? Or you could just take a level in Hexblade like everyone else. You also get Stone's Fortitude, which gives you one extra hit point for every sorcerer level you have, and a base AC of 13 plus your constitution modifier. Ditch dexterity, get down with the thickness. Finally, at first level, you get some bonus spell options. Most of them are smiting spells, which are unfortunately concentration and do not stack with Shadowblade, but it's nice to have some options. At level six, you get Stone Aegis, one of the more mathematically complex features I've seen in 5e. As a bonus action, you can create a protective barrier around an allied creature you can see within 60 feet for one minute. Whenever that ally takes bludgeoning, slashing, or piercing damage, Damage. You can reduce the damage by an amount equal to your sorcerer level plus two divided by four rounded down. Just when you thought D&D couldn't be more fun, they added algebra. All you really need to remember is the damage reduction is two at this level and it scales up to five when you reach level 18. More importantly, if a creature you can see within 60 feet hits the protected ally with an attack, you can teleport next to them and make an attack against them as a reaction. And if you hit, that attack deals extra force damage. This is incredible. Attacking as a reaction kicks ass and it puts you wherever the action is happening. At 14th level, you get Stone's Edge, which lets you add force damage equal to half your sorcerer level to one target of your damaging spells. There is no limit on this feature, except it can only be used once per spell. Quick and cast Booming Blade and then action cast Booming Blade is still amazing though, with this feature adding on an additional 14 to 20 damage every turn. Finally, at 18th level, you can now protect up to three people with your Stone Aegis instead of just one. 
and one of those targets can be yourself. The Stone Sorcerer rocks. On its own, it's got some decent power, but it's kept in check by not accessing extra attack like Blade Singers or other spellcasting marshals. But if you go multi-classing, this thing hits like a truck, with five levels in Warlock or Paladin giving you extra attack to spell Blade with the best of them. Hello, welcome to Wendy's. Can I take your order? You have to help me. I just killed a man. And I'm scared I'm going to do it again. Sir, I'm on minimum wage. I don't care. What do you want to eat? I need an outlet for my murderous thoughts. So maybe a junior bacon cheeseburger? Oh, I want to kill you so bad right now. Oh, okay. Well, what if you just like explored the most grim, dark, horrific D&D world ever to let those feelings out? Ooh, that might work. What is it? It's called Grim Hollow. Grim Hollow Transformed is a total refresh of the iconic Grim Hollow setting, 100% compatible with the 2024 D&D rules update. Two massive books containing everything you need to ground your game and make choices matter. It's got 40 dark fantasy subclasses, a full monster hunter class, a heritage trait system for unparalleled customization of your character, and 12 transformation options, allowing characters to become werewolves, vampires, or spectres. It's launching on Kickstarter October 1st, but you can join the VIP Discord right now using the link below to access playtest materials and get these beautiful Grim Hollow Metal Dice for free when you back the book. Dive in right now using the link below. Get your free dice and stay tuned for the epic Grim Hollow Transformed on October 1st. Brute Fighter. The Brute is basically what it sounds like. Fighter plus Barbarian without bothering to multiclass. Starting at level 3, when you pick this up, you get extra damage on all your weapon attacks. And unlike the Barbarian, it doesn't have to be a melee weapon. It starts as a d4 and scales across the game, capping out at an extra 1d10 per hit at 20th level. This is obviously analogous to the Barbarian's Rage, but it isn't limited to strength-based attacks, and fighters attack more than Barbarians. Sure, you don't get the damage resistances and you don't get advantage on attacks, but you are going to be dealing more damage with this than the Barbarian does with Rage. At 7th level, you get a bit harder to kill. You can now add a d6 to every saving throw you make. Who needs a cleric? You are your own bless. Additionally, if you use this on a death saving throw and the d6 bonus gets you to a 20 or higher, you treat it as if you rolled a 20 on that death save. That means you immediately spring back up with one hit point, no healing required. Seriously, who needs clerics? You are your own horrifying auto-resurrecting zombie abomination. At 10th level, you get another fighting style of your choice. This is the same as the champion fighter's 10th level ability, aka they ran out of ideas. Still, an extra fighting style like archery or defense or blind fighting is good. But if all that is still not enough extra damage, level 15 is here to kick your teeth in with devastating critical. It's just a flat damage boost added to every critical hit equal to your fighter level. That means no matter what type of weapon you are wielding, your crits will be devastated. Finally, at level 18, you become even harder to kill. As long as you're above zero hit points, but below half, you regain HP equal to your constitution modifier plus five every turn. Again, this is the same feature that the champion fighter has at this level, which is pretty suspicious. Still, the brute fighter is straightforward and powerful. It does what it does extremely extremely well. It also combos great with the actual Barbarian class. Two levels in Barbarian to grab rage and extra attack set this thing off beautifully. It's odd that it shares a few of the champion's features, but it also shares the champion's greatest benefits, which is it's perfect for newer players who aren't looking for too much complexity. And it's got tons of flavor as well. Primeval Druid. What if you had a pet kitten, but instead of a kitten, it was a Spinosaurus? This is the subclass that dares to ask that question. Primeval Druids are masters of the land before time, and this gives you a d4 bonus to your history checks. Okay, fair enough. It also gives you a dinosaur as a pet. From second level, you can expend a wild shape to summon a dino. 
The dinosaur lasts until it falls to zero hit points or you die, so you can just short rest after summoning it and it's effectively free. Then, even if your lizard does go down, you can summon it back twice per combat at the cost of only a wild shape and an action. It uses the primeval companion stat block. Like the revised Beastmaster Ranger, you can command it to attack as a bonus action and it takes its turn immediately after yours. It also gets the intercept reaction, which lets them tank half the incoming damage that would be dealt to an ally within five feet of them. It gets more powerful at sixth level with the prehistoric conduit feature. This lets you cast spells from your companion's position instead of your own. This has no range limitation. You can be throwing down Sleet Storm through your companion from the safety of a couch half a mile away. It's not actually that strong, but it is pretty funny. It also gets evasion against your spells, meaning it takes half damage on a failed save and no damage on a success. It's okay. At 10th level, Titanic Bond grows your companion's size from medium to large, letting you ride it if you're a medium-sized creature. It also forces anyone targeted by your spells to succeed on a wisdom saving throw or be frightened of you. Finally, at level 14, you get to improve your dino pal with Scourge of the Ancients. When you take a bonus action to command your companion, you can also expend a spell slot to give them a boost for one hour. It grows to huge in size. It gains temporary hit points equal to 10 times the level of the spell slot expended, and its weapon attacks deal an extra 1d8 plus the level of the spell slot you pay. On top of that, your scary ass dinosaur increases its speed by five times the level of the spell you expend. If you're willing to pump some serious magic into this, it goes crazy. Now, it is a shame that your primal companion never actually gets extra attack, but this subclass is undoubtedly cool. Riding around on a dinosaur, frightening enemies so they can't approach you and reducing incoming damage is a solid foundation for a build. You want my advice? Swap out the sixth level feature to instead let your dino attack twice, not once, when it takes the attack action, and make its weapon attacks magical. And that's everything you need to have a total blast with a fun, focused druid. Archivist Artificer. Artificer is the class to play if you want your character to be the smartest one at the table, but what if you could weaponize that smugness? Well, here's the Archivist. Let's start with the bonus spells. Hypnotic Pattern, Dissonant Whispers, Modify Memory, and Phantasmal Killer are all greats in their own ways. Dissonant Whispers is a lovely cantrip for a backline caster, because the movement it forces isn't technically forced movement. That means your melee frontliners can make opportunity attacks against the poor bastard you send scurrying away. But the big feature is Artificial Mind. This lets you implant a consciousness into an object, giving you bonus proficiencies depending on what that object is made of. This artificial intelligence also gets two abilities of its own at level one. The first one is Manifest Mind. As a bonus action, you can manifest that consciousness in spectral form. You can then use an action to see through it or cast spells through it. It's basically like a familiar. You can also use a bonus action to move it up to 30 feet, which you'll want to do to make use of its second feature, Information Overload. As an action, you can force a creature within five feet of your manifested mind to succeed on an intelligent saving throw or take 1d8 psychic damage. Like a cantrip, the damage of this feature scales as you gain in levels, and you can also burn a spell slot when you use it to deal extra damage, kind of like Divine Smite. But wait, there's more, because after you hit an enemy with this, the next attack roll made against them has advantage. Most creatures have garbage intelligence saves, so this is genuinely a solid use of your action each turn. At level 6, your artificial mind lets you set up a telepathic link with another creature, letting you speak telepathically even across planes of existence distance. It's okay. You also increase the damage of your psychic spells and your information overload ability by an amount equal to your intelligence modifier. This is really good. Now, when you expend a spell slot to increase the damage of your information overload, it gains a bonus effect. If a creature fails its saving throw, it is stunned until your next turn. Stunning an enemy on a failed intelligence save while dealing some pretty decent damage at the cost of one action and a first level spell slot is filthy. The sheer power of your intellect just caused their brain to shut down. It might be worth grabbing a level in wizard just to get more first level spells to burn into this. You also get the ability to teleport next to your artificial mind for free once per long rest. You can do it more if you'd like, but it'll cost a second level spell slot each time and it probably isn't worth it. You might have noticed that this unearthed arcana was broadly repackaged into the order of scribes wizard, but they are 
very different subclasses. Either way, this is an artificer that can hold its own with the best of them. Yes, it's hard to justify not being a battlesmith or an armorer, but the Archimist rewards you with some decent utility and spells backed up with serious late game power. If you want to support this channel, you can do so on the D&D Shorts Patreon. I release new races, classes, rules expansions, adventures, and more there every month. Your support on there makes these videos possible. Also remember to like and subscribe, check out other videos on the channel, and yeah, that's all I got. I'll see you next time.